been a while. Zone 3 Podcast. I am Robert. Yes. And I am Reggie. And back by popular demand. Probably our, one of our most requested guests. How many, what does this make for you? Three. Three. Uh, Rob Cloutier. Thanks for joining us, Rob. Appreciate you. Yeah. Um, Rob's here to discuss, well, first of all, he he named it. What do you said? You said, what was it? Uh, Fast Scans, Beautiful Images. I didn't I, say that. I think That's I, what you heard. I feel like you said that. <laughs> well, and I feel like the real reason why Rob is here, honestly, is there's a lot of green, green techs that are entering the field. And we actually just hired a few where we work at that came from Rob's program. And they're not like the traditional green techs that we have also hired that wasn't a part of his program. So we just want to kind of figure out, like, your perspective on where the field is at with how, you know, people coming in green and education status. But really, what are you doing differently? Like, why why the people who go to your program come out more successful? Pretty pictures in the shortest time, Mr. Jansen. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. Tomato, tomato. Keep going. <laughs> I do things differently. And uh, I always have in MR. And when I was younger, it used to get me in the trouble because I didn't always follow the rules because I had a zoomed out perspective of how we were going to use the MRI machine to image patients. And I think that that's important. So when you guys brought this to me a couple of weeks ago, it had been something that's been with me for really my entire career, but more so the last few months because my phone is blowing up again. And... The demand for MR is going out like it's it's the MR demand is rapidly growing, but the talent can't support it. So I'm being asked, how do you address this? And I said, well, if you want my involvement, I'm going to kind of take TNT to your current structure. Because I see technologists getting lost in protocols. They're in the weeds and there's 200 something protocols and they're trying to memorize them all and it's the wrong approach. I have a different approach and it's a looser approach. I watched your episode with Frank Shellock. He has been doing MRI safety so long that he's the guy, right? He's the expert. I'm not big into cliches. I like to come up with my own ideas. Right. But the one that fits with Frank is he's forgotten more than anybody will ever know. And because of that, he's able to zoom out and speak about things on a macro level. I watched him show you these implants and come at it from almost a philosophical angle, like show it to you, Reggie, what could happen to this? No, we're not worried about a changing gradient field. We're worried about RF. No, we're not worried about RF. We're worried about a changing gradient field. I think when you've done something long enough, you come at it from a different, more zoomed out level where you make it easier to the layperson, And that's what I do in my program. I do not go in and tell them to memorize what's in house. I do not do that. I start with the why and say, listen, we look at the body with MRI because we're able to see soft tissue better than the other cameras that we use in radiology. Start there. Right. Why is it that we're able to do that? And from there, um, I go. I, I think... Being in the weeds for a long, long, long time affords you the ability to zoom out and make things simple for, for new people. You kind of understand the goal of why we're there, right? A little bit better, right? So you're just pretty much taking that goal and just simplifying it, right? To the point, Reg, where I've been involved with an outpatient imaging center that's doing a ton of whole body imaging now because you're seeing this oh, yeah. fad, right? Yeah. And the new systems that are out there, you can plug in all these coils and you can scan somebody from brain down to the knees rapidly. And patients are paying cash for these preventative scans because they want to know what's wrong with them. They want to get ahead of it. And I get that, right. right? Right, right, right. They're coming into MRI suites and they're discounting the fact that they still got to go into an MRI machine and some of these people are claustrophobic. And I've been asked to come in and make these things more efficient and they, and they, and they say to the technologist, well, I'm claustrophobic. I come into the room and I say, well, then don't do it. And they're like, what do you mean? I paid for this. I'm like, yeah, what'd you pay for? Is there, is there something wrong with you? You came in here today on your own volition for a preventative scan. If we're going to move you into the bore and it's going to cause more trauma uh, than you currently have a year in your life, punt. What are we doing? We don't have to do this. All we do is take pictures. We do not cure anything. 
I've been in the weeds so long that I'm able to zoom out to the point where I tell patients, don't do it. <laughs> and I think that that's healthy. Right. <laughs> nice. So we're talking about the Kardashians, right? Yeah. What does that mean, Robert? Uh, Normally I'm with Kylie them. Jenner. I don't know. They're the ones that made the news. What's they call the whole, whole, body, the whole body? It starts with a P. Yeah, yeah, the company that's out there doing it. California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, they got a trendy name. Well, there's a couple yeah. of them. There's a couple. I, I try to relate everything to the Kardashians. Yeah, that's how I run my life, too. Yeah. <laughs> they still, yeah, they've done so well, those Kardashians. <laughs> well, I think, actually, you, you, yeah, you said something that kind of resonated with me, and I'm using that word intentionally, but um, a lot of times when you're first, you're new to MRI, you're learning what? What are these buttons? But you're, you're, approaching it from the angle of why first and with that becomes the uh, jump start in their competency and their skill level as a technologist because i'm seeing some of these techs that you've trained and i'm seeing compared to some of the techs that you haven't and they come from other facilities and education places and and there's a lot of green techs out there and i don't want to call them button pushers because that's offensive it's a four-letter word here right but at the end of the day if you don't know tr ranges or te then, uh, How to set up then you're just learning what, and you're not learning why. We are here as part of the solution. I think it's appropriate to call them button pushers because button pusher is not an offensive term unless you are a button pusher and you don't believe that you are, and then you'll get you know, annoyed at that, right? right? They are button pushers. An MRI technologist is not opening a protocol that somebody else built, spinning slices, hitting go, hoping it comes out well, and if it doesn't, saying, well, I used the protocol, because that is prevalent in our field. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Rampant in absolutely. our field, right? And that's one of the reasons why we're here. That's how the system is designed. That's how the system's designed. I've always gone the other way. You know, the first time I was on, you made a comment about how MRI technologists are artists. I had never really looked at it like that before, right? But you, I agree with you. We're producing art. How better or quicker to kill the spirit of the artist, of the MRI technologist, if you tell them, do it this way, and don't you dare do it a you're different way. You're just lines is all you're doing. That's all you're doing. I've always thought, teach them why, leave the what's and how's up to them, because then they can have meaning and purpose at their job, right. and they can say, hey, that looks really good, right? Can I show you how I did it? You know, I know we're trained to do it this way, but I decided to try it this way, and look at what happens. I mean, that's how innovation that's how innovation happens. The leaders uh, in our business, whether it be Toby or Frank or Manny or any one of those guys, do you think those guys sat there and said, oh, they told me how to do it this way? Right. All of those guys said, this is how we do it. It's not enough. Let me go in here on my own time, on my own volition, and figure out a different way, and then let me come back and tell you what I learned. And that's what I've done on the technologist side. So do you think that takes initiative on the text part, or do you think that they're just a product of their education? I think it takes initiative. I think that, uh, let's call it what it is, the leaders in any industry are always the top 5%. The other 95% kind of fall in somewhere. It's not to pick on those people. It's probably just not their passion. The, the 95% button pusher, we don't know anything about their personal lives. Maybe they go home and garden for 16 hours on the weekend. Right. That's where they that's where they want to make their contribution. Work is work for them. But I've always viewed it as I look at these technologists and I see how scared they are throughout the day. They're scared for the phone to ring. I always wanted to help them. Why sit here and be scared all day waiting for the phone to ring? Why don't you learn what they need and then you can give it to them and then you can chill at work? I always. Right. Well, ironically, it's like the more competent you are, the less anxiety you have, but the more anxious you are it's less competent you are so it's kind of like inversely proportional it's it's interesting because you're right like teach somebody to be confident and learn why they why they do the things that they do and not just what well and the issue with some of the green techs that have been coming in is they're not always trainable so this is some of the biggest questions that we have about you because i've even seen this situation happen with robert as he's trying to train somebody new he could probably tell the story but they're not always receptive. Because what we really want to do is get them up to speed. The button pushers, we want to get them up to speed, you know, try to align them with how they should kind of be looking at these scenarios. Um, but sometimes there's pushback there, which kind of makes it hard, right? Before you, will you tell that story? So, well, I've got a couple stories. Before you get to any of them, it's important to understand where we are in the cycle. Uh, 
this is this is a little bit of a goofy example, but I think it helps. Um, I won't even do that. Let's just say we're reactive in the MRI business. We have the patients on the schedule. We have the huge fixed cost MRI machine burning a hole in the organization's pocket, and we need a tech. There's a staffing shortage. We need somebody there. We've got to close down these shifts. We've got to close down Saturdays because we don't have the people. So it's not realistic to think, let's go find this person, bring them in, and groom them for three months with the wise. They get thrown to the whatever the metaphor is. We've all been there. So that's part of the problem, right? right? But they have to also show initiative because they want to always, people should st- always strive to be better and not just com- become complacent with what status quo is, whatever that is as far as peers go and like expectations of their facility. I, I don't know. Like, so the, the story that he's alluding to, and I've got a couple is, and, and it's frustrating because we work at a place that some, oh, well, according to different resources, they consider the number one hospital in the world. We're held to high standards. We can't say names, but right. it's a prestigious place. And when I first went there, they required at least five years minimum of experience. And, and I like that. And I put in my time before I went there and, and I went into it surrounded by a lot of, a lot of smart people. And now with its current climate, short staffing, they're, they're hiring people that are straight out of school. They're hiring people from, uh, from other facilities that aren't very credible. And I'm finding a lot of incompetency with that and the learning curve is much different. And so that's frustrating. Um, so, for example, we have one tech who, I and I train a lot of these people. Well, I mean, we all do either. You know, right. we're all kind of a team effort there. So I'm not just pretending like I'm the be- the only one that trains. But I, so I train them. And there's this one tech that I'm training, and on the exact same patient, I see him make the exact same mistake three times, and so I talk to him with some sensitivity, but I'm a straight shooter as well. People think that I'm a New York kind of a guy and I'm not from New York, but I have that personality. I'm like very straight shooter. I'm blunt. I'm honest with my opinion. You know where you stand with me. But, and so I was straight with him and I talked to him the same as I would talk to my kids. And I talked to my kids extremely like, um, just consider it and, but direct too. you know, I'm very sensitive to them. But so I said, I said, Hey, you know, you just made the exact same mistake three times on the same patient, that's not okay. And I said that, that's not okay. And I would say it to my kids, that's not okay. This isn't, you're not a waiter working at IHOP and you forgot this customer's refill. Big shout out to IHOP. <laughs> yep. This is, is no, you know, if you are a server at IHOP, Robert holds you at the same level. Uh, well, no, I don't. I, I, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but this is how A mistake at IHOP yeah. is not as big of a deal as a mistake at your hospital. Absolutely not, because yeah. like... Uh, if you don't get your <laughs> refill, if you see the bottom of your glass before you want to, that's whatever. But if your work, if you go to a, a healthcare facility that has a reputation to be one of the top in the world, not just the country, you have a certain level of expectations. And if you're there, and, and by the way, every patient has a threshold. And I think that that's something that techs don't appreciate. So as far as fast scans go, it's important because there should never be downtime. I hate hearing silence. You should always have the next sequence prescribed before the previous one finishes. And when you see that there's downtime in between, I, as I've been the, t- the patient that's on the, uh, and I, by the way, I'm just there for protocol development. I'm not even like a, a pain patient, but I'm just sitting there thinking, what are these guys doing? Why am I listening to silence right now? And, and then if from a facilities, like an admin perspective, it's like they say silence is money. Like that's just wasting money. Right. So you're wasting money, you're wasting patient's time. And by the way, that patient has a threshold of time. How many times have you had a patient squeeze the ball with literally one minute left? Right. I can't do this anymore. Well, did you make that exam three minutes longer than it had to be? If you did, then that patient would have never squeezed the ball. And that's something that people don't really think about. So like when you're doing repeats and you made the same mistake three times on the same patient, that's not okay. These people come here with certain level of expectations. They're going through a lot. They are. They're going through a lot and they've got a lot on their plate. And if, if they could just rely on one thing, they should rely on you being able to do your job correctly and get them in and out with a certain level of quality and no longer than it has to be. And so that was frustrating. Well, and when you were trying to kind of get him up to speed, after that, he was just kind of, he was put off by your, you being so direct that he did not want to kind of be trained by you again. Like he would literally try to avoid you. 
<laughs> yeah, and it's unfortunate because now he keeps his distance from me. And and I, maybe I was too, uh, maybe I wasn't sensitive enough. Yeah, I don't think. But this is, this is the professional world. Yeah. All right. This isn't. Yep, this ain't a preseason game. Yes. And we talked about this in the first episode. If you're going to come with a just a tech mentality and your what you do for a living defines who you are as a person and you're going to take the you old way tables then then you, you know that's for your own, that's for your own development you got to figure that out on your own right you're always going to have somebody like you who's upstream from you in the process who's going to tell you when you're not making the grade that's capitalism and we, we zoom full down. disclosure i want to be clear cuz i make mistakes too we all make mistakes Come to me if I make a mistake. Tell me what mistake that I made, and you will see that I will not repeat that mistake. Not only not repeat it, but you'll be open to the feedback because you I understand it. it's not a it's not a slight towards you. When you say what you just did three times in a row is not enough, you're not saying you're a worthless person. What you're saying is it's not enough. So we got to get it to be enough. And if they're not able to be, you know, stable enough as a human being to accept that feedback. Then you got two problems. Not only do they not have the knowledge and they don't make the grade, they're not open. They're not open to ever getting it. Right. Right. That kind of person probably, you know. Well, and sometimes I feel like you just have to. This is one thing I think you're amazing at is you just have to water it down enough so that they understand the mistake. And I think one of his biggest issues is that even though Robert called him out and told him what he was doing wrong. He was like, oh, okay. But he did not understand what Robert was trying to tell him. But yep. he, he didn't he didn't say that. So he just said, oh, okay. And he made the mistake again. Well, let's empathize with him for a moment. Think about what a defensive, helpless position that is. Right. When you come from the memorizing what's and how's. It's intimidating, for sure. And somebody's coming at you with that what and how you just did is not correct. And they have no ability to get into the why in actually critically thinking that. That's a pretty helpless feeling. Well, and then the the one thing that I found, and I guess it's unfortunate, the thing about it that's unfortunate is that he knew Reggie and I from the podcast before he even started working there. And he thought that was the coolest thing in the world to come work with Reggie and I. Like, oh my God, I've been watching your podcast. And then here I am criticizing him. Sure. That he went from thinking, oh, I would love to work with you. Now he's keeping his distance from me. And it's because I called him out on it. And it's, I guess it is what it is. And and the mistake that he made was he scanned um, in the wrong plane three different times. Mind you, before he even did it the first time, I said, hey, because what I did is I pulled a SAG over from a different protocol. And I said, hey, you're going to run this as an axial. But I pulled it over as a SAG and I just relabeled it. So it might come up as a SAG, but just make sure that you scan it as an axial. And I, I leave for 10 minutes, I come back, he scanned it as a SAG. And that's alarming on so many levels. Uh, uh, but the greatest one to me is, again, zoom out. The people who come through my program, if they don't QC their exam, they literally, uh, that's not one I'm very patient with. I tell them in a lovingly, as kindly as I can, but I'm like, listen, we can get anybody in here to hit the button and not look at what it came up as. I don't care that you ran three sagittals. I do. Not as much as the fact that they didn't notice they ran three sagittals. Right. Because well, that, that means my issue. Yeah, you're not QCing the images. And it ain't like an x-ray tech yeah. where it goes to a QC department. You are the QC technologist. And if you're not QCing the images, what you're really telling me is you have no issue if that person leaves the facility and has to come back in a couple of days and take more time off work. It's a lack of empathy. But actually, I'm going to take it one step further. You, the, when you're saying talking about QCing images, you're talking about a reactive thing. I'm saying you need to be proactive. You need to be checking your prescriptions to make sure that what you're doing is what it's intended to be. But when you're QCing images, that's more reactive. You're like, oh, crap, I scanned this in the wrong protocol or in the wrong uh, plane. That should have never happened. Without question, but it's a safety net. I don't love the la I don't love the react. I don't love the word reactive because it catches you. Now, what the safety net does is it catches you, and then you're like, okay, I'm not dead now. Oh shit, I forgot to look at right. So it gives you the chance to go back and learn that. But without the safety net, 
then I agree completely with you, but there's still a component of that's part of the learning process. So if you right. tell them, hey, listen, QC is mandatory, then that means that the exam might have been 15 minutes longer than it but, would be. But you say it's part of the learning process. In my opinion, there should be a fundamental understanding. Like you should have the one-on-one stuff down. I think this, I agree with this you, is Robert. the whole reason pretty much why the people in your program come out so much more ready for success in MRI is because he was just ready to scan how the however the thing popped up, however those slices popped up, he was just ready to place it over the anatomy and scan it. Even though you told him, hey, this is going to pop up wrong, he's been trained to be just be a button pusher. He's been trained to, hey, it's going to come up like this. You just cover this and without even looking at sequence name, without looking at anything, he's just been trained to be a button pusher. And I think that's the problem with the industry right now. It's a thing. The sagittal T1 is a thing. Call it a widget. Right. And we're not going to go into it today because we don't have time, but I briefly described the bucket system on episode two that we did. Link in the description. Right. Bucket, you know, the bucket system was four different, four different buckets. Right. Slice plane. Right. So it would be a sagittal. And then it would be the weighting or the contrast, then the pulse sequence, and then the mode, 2D versus 3D. So the students that go through my program, they ha they don't say SAG T1, or I'll, I'll wait for them to correct themselves. They say SAG T1 Fast Spin Echo 2D. Now, what's the advantage of that? The advantage of that is letting them know that a Fast Spin Echo doesn't always work. Sometimes you need to run just a regular Spin Echo. Not very much anymore, but... Right? Right. Sometimes you don't have time to run a Fast Spin Echo, or SAR won't allow it, so now you run a Gradient Echo. Right? Or sometimes you need to do a T1. I want them to understand that the pulse sequence is separate from the contrast. Bucket two and bucket three are different. So if somebody comes in with metal susceptibility artifact issues, I'll say, well, we still need a T1, right? But what you don't need is a gradient echo because it's going to be worse. So go to a fast spin echo. So when you can understand the four individual buckets and you can sub things in. Oh, I still want a T1, but I have to use a different pulse sequence. Or I still want a fast spin echo, but I want a different contrast. Or I needed to run a coronal T1. I imported a sagittal T1 and it was bucket one that had to be changed. No big deal. I train my technologist that way. Once you build a sagittal T1 in the femur, the last thing you'd ever want to do is import a brand new coronal T1, copy and paste the sagittal T1, rename it. Now the field of view matches, the slice thickness matches, everything matches, and now you spin it and now you get your coronal. And the advantage of that is whatever the region of interest was that you showed the rat on the sagittal, you're showing them the same region of interest on the coronal. So they're without these fundamental understandings of imaging. Right. I even dumb it down, Robert, to the point of, Imagine being a radiologist and quit thinking that they hung the moon, okay? They went to school longer than you did. We take the pictures, they interpret the images. Do you all know how they interpret the images? They look at it from here, and then they look at it from here. <laughs> they step up on a ladder, and they look at it from here. <laughs> That's what they do. Right. And if you run three sagittals, they got to go like this. One, two, three. They can't go like this and see the same damn pathology from the side. I break it down like that. Right. I'm like, stop promoting them to be this supreme being. They went to school for what they do. Help them do what they do. Right. Don't, don't be so inferior to them. Back to episode one. Right. I go all the way back to that. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, so what is the solution? Yeah, like, because we, I feel like our community are, you know, people who watch some do podcasts a lot of time are either new techs, so it might be some of those green people who are out there, but also... It's, it's always those people who go above and beyond, right? That are like high speed techs too. So like, how can we help them train some of these new techs and what can new techs kind of do to help get up to speed as well? Okay, so let's do it. So I thought about how we could do this in a condensed way and we're gonna zoom out. All right. Uh, let's call it the MRI expert, okay? The MR expert, not the tech, not the button pusher, not whatever, the MR expert. And that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. There's 40,000 of us in the in the country, right? Yeah, I think so. 40,000. Okay. That's a very, very small profession. Right. Okay? Right. We should be experts. We don't do CAT scan. We don't do x-ray. We don't do mammal. I know some people do. Right. But for the most part, MRI techs are running the MRI machine. If you don't know how to run the MRI machine, well, that's kind of a problem because if we don't know how to do it, who would? Who would? Yeah. So the MRI expert. We have two customers patient and the radiologist. We're a liaison. 
And that's why Pretty Pictures in the Shortest Time has been my moniker for as long as I can remember, Robert, because the pretty pictures are for the radiologist. We satisfy customer number one with the pretty pictures. We satisfy customer number two in the shortest time, and that's the patient. Now, in the shortest time is not as narrow as that might sound. It's be comfortable, give them instructions so they know what to expect, and we'll get into that. It's relative, yeah. Let's talk about pretty pictures. What is a pretty picture? What do you guys consider a pretty picture? Because I define it three different ways. How would you guys define? Uh, Diagnostic integrity. Yep. Low delay. Resolution. Yeah. Okay. Diagnostic confidence, right? Yes, you have to be able to make an accurate read, right? right. You guys said resolution. Right. Resolution is one of the three ways that I define a pretty picture. And that is zoomed out, isn't it? Because it's the same way I take a you know, picture of you two right now with my iPhone. Right. Right? The first thing you got to do is zoom it up. How good do we look, right? right? That's resolution that allows for that. Okay, so how do you determine resolution in MRI? Because our primary customer, I shouldn't say primary, one of our customers, the radiologists, a lot of them think that the only way you define resolution is through the field of view. So much so that on off, oftentimes you'll see on protocols, they'll say, use this field of view on this exam. Mm -hmm. I've always fought that. Because they're only looking at half of it. Yeah, and I think it lacks critical thinking skills, especially when you do like MSK studies. And they, yeah, every patient is different, you know. And, and and there's a lot of similarities. Don't get me wrong, but a lot of times people come to our our facility. There's a lot of new hires, right? And they're told right away, "Don't change field of views. Don't change, especially on MSK." And I say, you know what? Just so you know, I change field of views all the time. What? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> But every single time that I can I do, I could justify it if ever questioned. And I'm, and I'm happy to make that, have that conversation. So don't be afraid to change field of views. Right. But if you're going to change field of views, let there be a purpose and just know that, that you might have to justify it. And, but if there's a purpose and you can justify it, then absolutely. And I pull radiologists aside and I, I always use the language that's not productive. It's not productive to mandate a fixed field of view that can't change. Let's talk about pixel size instead. Now, you want to talk about pixel size, we can sit in here and we can, we can work together. Pixel size allows technologists and RADs to work together. So it's not field of view. It's field of view divided by the matrix. Right. And that gives you your pixel size. Now, it's not just per patient, which it is, right? You get a gigantic shoulder and the dude's breathing heavy and you got to go quick. Right. How about the equipment that you're working on? Because prior to 23, well, the, whatever. Right. GE is half of the yeah, MRI machines yeah. out there. Field of view on everybody with every coil, yeah. You can't do that small of a field of view because you have to turn on no phase wrap. Right. And if you understand imaging parameters, when you turn on no phase wrap, it cuts your necks in half, although the system doesn't show you. That's why when you work on an inflexible GE with no phase wrap, which they've moved away from, right, right now it's oversampling just like Siemens is, does. Right. But when you use 16X and lower, you're using no phase wrap. And there's a lot of machines out there that use no phase wrap. It's all, it's fixed on or off. Well, when it's on, the reason why the time stays the same is because they cut the necks in half. It just doesn't show it to you. And that's when you get the fine line artifact, which they've since created a CV for to compensate for. But the point is, which way are you going to run your phase on an axial shoulder? There's only one way to run your phase on axial shoulder, and that's A to P. Well, if they're saying 12 field of view for all professional baseball players, no, because they have muscles that go beyond the 12 field of view. And now if I'm on a 16X or lower, now I have to turn on no phase wrap, which I need to double the next for if I want a same image quality picture. And now you've just doubled my scan time, but out. You don't get to tell me what the field of view is. Those are techniques and those are up to me. What's your more then qualified for is to tell me what pixel size you want when you're looking at a shoulder. And I'll be happy to give you a 0.5 pixel size all day long because when I make my field of view bigger so I don't have any wrap, I know I lost resolution. I'm going to increase the matrix, and now I only have to use two necks without no phase wrap, and my imaging time is half as much. Do you find that there are certain vendors that make it easier to do? Like, for example, I think Philips uh, kind of caters to that. I think that in the old days... Siemens made it easiest because oversampling anti-aliasing was a percentage and right. you could turn on as much as you needed and it contributed to your signal and it showed it to you, but it also contributed to your time because Siemens didn't cut the necks in half like GE did with their no phase wrap. 
Um, in the old days, Phillips had something called foldover suppression, right? Mm -hmm. So I think in the olden days, Siemens was the most flexible, but nowadays it's a percentage anti-aliasing. It um, directly impacts your time, and I think that that's always been the best because you use as much as you want. And sometimes you can use it even even when you're not concerned about wrap, but you need just a little bit more signal, and you guys know that. Sure. You can turn on a little bit of oversampling to increase your signal um, right. when you're worried about signal. But resolution is the most important thing on an MRI image, but you got to understand it's field of view divided by matrix, and you probably have a rectangular matrix, so you have to do two different calculations, and that gives you your pixel size. Do you have anything else to define um, image quality? Two other things. Um, one is phase smearing, motion, okay? Oh, yeah. If the person's moving, or if you're running your phase through something that's moving, whether it be breathing or a vessel. Pop a teal on a knee. Anything, you're going to have a crappy image. You're damn right that contributes to a pretty picture. Again, I'm zoomed out. Right. I'm not talking to MRI techs right now. I'm trying to talk to the layman. Right. You need to have a pixel size that is small enough to be considered high resolution. You need to not have a motiony picture, which is to say you need to not have any phase smearing. Right? Right. And you need to eliminate fat. And I use the word eliminate deliberately. Because we have fat suppression, we have fat saturation, we have fat separation. Forget it. Zoom out. Fat makes the radiologist's job harder. So I tell students on day one, if we have tons of fat in our body, if you're going to... for yourself. <laughs> you have less, Robert, yes. And I'm about 140 on my shoulder, just so you know. What is it? 140. 140 what? 14 field of view. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. yeah. I just want to be clear about that. We have tons of... Let <laughs> them distract me right now. <laughs> we have a ton of fat in our body. If it's bright, it's going to make it harder to see what we really care is bright, and that's pathology. That's fluid. Right. Okay? Right. So I tell MRI techs on day one that the fat is usually going to be dark. Right. I have a little joke with the students that you now have employed. Ask them whose responsibility fat, fat elimination is. They'll say, mine. <laughs> That's right. right. So if the protocol is built with chemical fat saturation and they have an ACL screw in their knee, okay, or if you're using a field of view over 30 centimeters and it's built with chemical fat saturation, right. or if uh, you're way off isocenter because you're doing a shoulder on somebody who's 350 pounds, and you're trying to run chemical fat sat, you're not going to give the radiologist what they need. It's your responsibility to eliminate fat. You should have done a stir. You should have done a Dixon technique. You should have moved off of chemical fat saturation. Right. It's your responsibility to make fat dark. But 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 there's no metal protocol. What right? are you supposed to do if there's no metal protocol? They have to understand that they need to remove the fat-saturated sequence, chemical fat saturation, and they have to replace it with an IR or a Dixon technique. But they also have to understand, well, they have to have buy-in that fat elimination is their responsibility. The radiologist can't do it. Right. You have to make fat dark. Right. Okay? And that's not just um, with T2-weighted imaging in MSK. That's also every time you give GAD. Because I like to, I like to say it like this. Fluid is bright, gadolinium is bright. Well, if fat's bright with fluid and gadolinium also bright, you're not going to see it as well. So anytime you're looking for bright fluid, you have to turn the fat dark. And anytime you inject gadolinium, you have to make the fat dark. Now, we have times when we don't do that, when we image the central nervous system, fats, you know, looking at the cord, things like that. Yeah. Fat suppression sometimes obscures the image. And when we're doing gadolinium, Sometimes if you try to fat sat areas with air interfaces, um, you won't get proper fat saturation or uniform fat saturation, and we bail on it. Of course, in Dixon techniques allow for us to come back. Right. I'm talking about the soft tissue neck or in and around the sinuses or the bony foot. Um, fat, fat elimination works just fine when you use a Dixon technique. So that's what I do on day one, Robert. So take it back. So take it back. So pretty much what you're saying is that you make sure – that day one, they recognize what their goal is. Like, you, you want a quality image. Pretty pictures. To get the reading. And quality image is pixel size. Right. Uh, fat saturation. Fat elimination in my okay. language. No motion. In no motion. 
And by the way, I don't say image quality because to me, that's moving towards a in the weeds perspective. I say pretty pictures. I'm using layman's terms on purpose. They come in, oh my gosh, I'm in the MRI space. Relax, you zone took three, baby. You in zone three? Zone three. I'm like, <laughs> relax, you took 15 selfies this morning. It's the same concepts. You wanted a pretty picture when you took a selfie, you want a pretty picture when you do an MRI. Right. And yes, what builds a pretty picture in MRI? Pixel size, AKA resolution, not just the field of view. Right. Making sure it's not motiony, right. a word we've created in MRI, right? Phase smearing. And of course, making sure that fat does not distract the radiologist from what they're looking at. And inherently, we're taught that um, to achieve all three things, that it comes with a price, and that price being time. So, like, how are you able to keep the time down by still achieving those three things? Yeah, that's the second half of it. So, perfect segue. Good, keep going. Nice segue, Robert. I'm gonna. <laughs> so, Reggie, can you pull up the axial shoulder picture? Oh yeah, for sure. It's a nice looking image, right? All right. Uh, young person, right? Mm -hmm. Can still see the growth plate. Really nice labrum, blah, 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 blah. Nice uniform fat suppression, bright fluid, no motion. Um, we can all tell uh, that that's a nice pixel size, right? Right. That would be the definition of a pretty picture, Robert. Pixel size is appropriate. There's no motion. And um, fat is not bothering us at all there. It's eliminated. Right. So if that was a bumble date, you would get asked for a second date? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. And if I was on bumble and I thought girls cared about axial intermediate images of the shoulder, that would be my profile picture. <laughs> they do. <laughs> yeah, of course it's stupid. I'm just trying to roll with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Yep. I love Mr. Jansen. He exists for many reasons because we're not just one thing. But one of the things he loves doing is putting speed bumps in front of me when I'm cruising down the road. And he wants to see whether or not it's going to knock me off course. Your suspension is yeah, yeah. No, I have good suspension. Yeah. Hey, right. Keep them coming. Yeah. Uh, luckily, he told me about Bumble an hour before the episode, so I knew what it was. <laughs> He's a connoisseur. Got it. <laughs> so I have something called caps, okay? Love it. Something I created Big fan. because it's simple. Caps, C A P, and a little S. Like the S belongs to the about it. I'll tell you all about Robin. You'll turn into a all about it. You'll tell you'll he'll turn into a rap song. <laughs> right. Caps on caps on caps. No, I'm sorry. The C sta the C and A are something that the button pushers will recognize because that's how they're trained. Coverage and angles. That's how they're trained oh, yeah. in the MRI school now. Mm -hmm. They are trained to go to the open lab, and this is how we scan a shoulder. You cover from here to here, and you angle here. Then you hit go. Okay? Now, coverage, let's consider an axial shoulder. Um, I've been trained to scan from above the AC joint. Uh, through the glenoid. Through the glenoid, usually five, six, seven slices below the inferior labrum. That gets you through the shoulder, okay? Right. So when my students sit down to scan a shoulder, they have to have their caps in front of them. Caps is in a three-ring binder, and they will open it to shoulder, and then within their shoulder caps, they'll have axial sagittal coronal. And when they're planning an axial, they have to be open to the axial page. Coverage. You scan from here to there. It was P parameters? Uh, no. Don't jump ahead, Robert. Position. Breathe. Remember we did this episode? <laughs> Not positioning either. Dang it. You both relax. <laughs> Coverage. Okay, don't jump ahead. Okay, okay. I tell all these students, I try not to say my students because they don't belong to me. They're just students, and I'm privileged enough to be helping them. Oh. CNA. Coverage. You scan from here to there. Again, layman's terms. You scan from here to there, and they write it in their book, from above the AC joint to approximately six slices below the inferior labor. And it's written in their book. It's not arbitrary. They never have to learn a different coverage. It's there for the rest of their career. Angle, orthogonal. There is no angle on the axial shoulder All right. if their arm is down by the side. If they're overweight and their humerus is off at an angle, it will say perpendicular to the shaft of the humerus. Okay? Coverage and angle are permanent. They're never going to change. I tell them all this all the time. Like, what is so hard about MRI? I just told you everything you need to know about an axial shoulder. It doesn't change on Tuesdays. Come on. 
learn the shoulder so we can move on to the humerus and the elbow and the wrist. Come on, what are we doing? Try I know, tell him. I know what the P is before you say it. Yes. Can I? Yes. It's hey. not what you think. Oh. Face. Face considerations. Now, this is where you separate the button pushes to the next level. Right. Now, there's a level there's after this. Critical thinking skills. Yep. Yep, because you have to start thinking now. So now that you have your coverage and angle, and this is a little corny, but sometimes I'm corny, right? Right. C-A is the state abbreviation for California. I lived there for a little while, and in California, the most important thing in California, I'm generalizing. Oh, no cap? <laughs> I'm from Massachusetts, so obviously I'm going to goof on California a little bit, right? <laughs> no cap. That's good. I don't even get it. Uh, it's, like, it's a new school thing. These kids are saying cap. What does it mean? Ask my kid. My kids are outside the room right now waiting, but... Should we bring we, on a podcast? Yeah, should, yeah please. <laughs> It means like, uh, it means like for real. Cap? Like, no cap. Like legit. Like cap is like fake. Like it's not real. And then no cap means it is for real. All right. Cool. Right? Yeah. Although the words change, the important things continue to remain the same, right? <laughs> right. You need to know when someone's full of shit when they're not. Right. Right. We used to say uh, real talk. Real talk. Back in the day. And um, I used to just say no shit. <laughs> You say it afterwards. Yeah, hey, you're really old school. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah, like you, you go on and on and on and you say, no shit. Right, right, right. But, you know, there's different ones. I'm <laughs> thinking of all of them right now, but. Yeah. <laughs> Let me keep it to myself. If you got a good one, please leave it in the comments. Do it. <laughs> nice. So. What's really important in California is appearance. <laughs> yes. Right? Right. So right. whenever I would stand behind the student on the console, and they set up their slices, and they do their coverage and their angle right, I would say, just to be corny, I like your style. Because that seems like a California thing to say. <laughs> and what that would mean is you can move on to phase considerations. Now, this is where you got to think. Now, phase considerations, okay? You know what I say? What do you say? If you like it, then you should have put a shim on it. Because he's a rapper. Right. If you like it, you should have put a shim on it. That's a take on Beyonce's. You should put a ring on it. Hey, turn up. Hey, turn up. Hey. Yeah, I don't listen to Beyonce. You don't I'm either. Okay, I do. Yeah, it's cool. I'm a Jay Z fan. I like some Rihanna stuff. Just because it's a female doesn't mean I won't listen. Right. But Beyonce, I don't know. If you like, you should have well, put a ring. Got this new country song that just breaking records. I guess. I'm sorry. I know we're <laughs> kind of detouring here. To get you back on track, if you're in California and you like their coverage, you like their angles, and you say I like your style, and then that's their way of saying, well, what's the final step? Exactly right. When I say I like your style, they transition to phase considerations. <laughs> Thought that word would get you. Um, no. Phase considerations. <laughs> Bro, I'm, you can't phase me. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> <That's pretty good. laughs> good ass. Now that you're on phase considerations, they assess for three things. Let me back up for a minute. When they get the phase considerations, I say, which way you going? Now, look at that axial shoulder. Jeff Post, uh, talented MRI technologist, good guy, and somebody, really know that name. Um, somebody who came through uh, my program, he saw me trying to explain phase direction. And Jeff has been like, you know, Jeff is student number like 9 million for me. And he looks at me, he goes, why don't you just say this way or that way? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, when you're doing an axial shoulder, rather than solving the riddle of GE showing the frequency direction and having to unwind that whole big discussion you've been doing for all these years, why don't you just say, on an axial, you can go this way or that way? I was like, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, look, on an axial. He took his finger and he goes, you can go this way or that way. He goes, the only two ways you can go with your phase on an axial are this way or that way. He said, on a sagittal, it's this way or that way. On a chronal, it's this way or that way. Look at that axial picture. You guys know we can go A to P or left to right with our phase right. because the slice selection gradient is S to I, so that's not an option, right? right. right. Well, just draw your finger both directions. That's left to right, and that's A to P. Yeah. Now, it's not quite moving the needle with you guys the way it did with me because I've had to tell technologists what is the optimal phase direction when you're doing an axial shoulder and Jeff realized it was easiest to actually look at the axial picture where just the field of view box is. Uh, because I used to tell students, quit looking at the axial when you're setting up an axial. All you care about is the coronal and the sagittal to get your coverage and angle. Right. But Jeff's like, no. But now when you get the phase considerations, look at the 
image that you're actually acquiring and just do this with your finger. Would you rather go like this way? Would you rather do this or this? Now, if you did that there, you'd realize that if you went left to right, you have the rest of the body to contend with. You can't go left to right. You have to go in the short axis, which is A to P. So I would tell students, what's the optimal phase direction? And they would have to say A to P. And I'd say, good. Now assess for motion wrapping time. That was the process. So let me review. Coverage and angles, I like your style. Move on the phase considerations. Which way are you going? This way or that way? They would base their decision on whether or not they were going this way or that way upon motion wrapping time. Can I throw a speed bump in there? Sure. Rock your world? Do it. I would say it's not just AP. It's also PA, left, right, right, left. So there's actually four options. And there is a time that you should pick PA over AP. When? Well, you, I think you would get less motion if you did PA versus AP. Why? Just because of breathing. Why? Motion comes in the phase direction, right? Yeah. Motion is only in the phase You're direction. Get the motion mostly from the anterior portion of that image. So if you're coming from PA, but like, for example, if you're going right to left lip versus left to right, well, if you go from here, if you go left to right, you're going into the lung versus out of the lung into the area of interest. I don't know that it has a difference. I think it does. Keyword, I don't know. I don't know. And by the way, other than only certain vendors will give you PA and AP, right? That's this true. is a Siemens thing. That's true. Well, s inverting the gradient. Right? Well, with Siemens, you can actually uh, change the angle 180 degrees to make it. The right. But if you're on a GE and you're looking for AP and PA, you won't find it. Right. So, um, did I just rock your world? Uh, I'm not convinced. I'm open to the fact that there is a difference in image quality between PA and AP. I'm and open to it. Right, right to left on the yep. shoulder. I'm open to it. Okay. Uh, I would like to be shown it, um, and then understand it. Because the, the most of the concern would be motion, right? Mm -hmm. So it would come down to how we're filling case space, right? If we're flip, if we're inverting the gradient in the starting point, there's going to be a different starting point. It's going to be inverted, right? perhaps, yeah. right? Contrast goes in the middle. Right. Detail goes in the periphery. Right. You gather most of the contrast earlier in the sequence, right? Right. And you know that because if you stop a pulse sequence when it's got like 30 seconds left, it will still reconstruct sometimes, but you'll see a really hazy image. So you know the resolution's filled last. Yeah. So your point probably has some merit right. depending on which direction you go in which area is moving more to your point with the chest. The chest is moving more than the back. Um, that may very well have a... Have a um, should we wrap it up? Impact. Go yeah. <laughs> Let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> so no, this is good. Listen, right. yeah, when you become the teacher, right, you realize that right. what that means is you're forever a student. Because right. the only way I can keep teaching oh, is by yeah. keep on learning. It's, yeah. it's the only way. I love that. I, I learn more from my students. Um, you know, I've gathered all this knowledge at this point in the game because I've been teaching. Right. And when you teach, you have to know things. And you all, you have two of those oh shit moments per lecture where you're like, oh, I don't know that that's the case. And then you go back later. And yeah. so, so thank you for that. Yeah. So phase considerations. Motion wrap time. So look at the shoulder. They say A to P is the optimal direction. And I say it is. And my students have to say to me before they hit go, less motion, going A to P. Not worried about rap because there is none, is none. And then they say time and they look down and they tell me whether or not that's an appropriate time or not for the field strength magnet they're on, for the antenna they're using, for the parallel imaging factor that they've chosen, and TR dot to dot to dot dot dot. That's how my students do it. They don't hit go until they go through coverage, angle, phase considerations, optimal direction, assess for motion, rap, and time. It's almost like canals, like pilot checklist, right? Like you've got a checklist. I think I, mean, I think the power in, you know, this type of stuff is just simplifying it into steps, right? Like if you rep, if you do it the same way every time, then it, it really takes away that margin of error that creates, you know, you winging it every time you get a shoulder and you're like, hold on, did I do, what did I do last time when I had this similar issue, you know, type of thing. So. And, and you see that fear in new technologist eyes when they sit down and there is no methodical nature to their process. Right. It is, it is different every time and you see them 
they'll look at this and they'll click on that and then they'll go back and change the angle. They'll 2KV it five different times yeah, during yeah, it, right? Yeah. They'll go over here. I don't let the students that work with me do that. They go methodical. After their coverage and angle is set and I say, I like your style, you better not touch your slices again. If I don't say I like your style, you better add a slice, you better change your angle, you better do something before you ever talk about phase direction. It's worked for me my entire career, and that's what the set method was. Same every time, right? Yep. I do it the same way every time. That's just like pilots do. We talked about that before. Yeah. You have a checklist, um, and uh, it simplifies their lives. No, totally. Robert, uh, excuse me, Reggie, um, that's satisfying your radiologist customer. That whole process, pretty pictures. So as you said before, you have two customers as an MR tech. Right. I do. And before I get to the second customer, the, the, the patient, the client, the customer, the person who's sick or injured, <laughs> notice I didn't talk about TR or TE or echo train or receiver bandwidth or parallel imaging factors. Right. Flipping. Any of this stuff. Right, yeah. All of that stuff comes after this in the program, okay? Because you know whose protocols they're running at the beginning? Mine. Right. And then after they can fluidly move through this process and not have a bunch of dead time in between sequences, then what they do is I say, okay, you're doing a shoulder now, but the only thing that's in the protocol is a scout. All right. And then they copy and paste the scout and they turn it into the axial intermediate fat suppressed image, turn it into the coronal tear, and then that comes later. Nice. And that's not for sport. That's not because I think I'm cool. That's not because I want me to you know, say, oh, my students are the best. That's because when you go from a Phillips to a GE and there isn't a protocol on that, um, I don't want you to say, oh, I'm just a Phillips tech. That's such horse shit. To right. Me. If you're an MR technologist, you're an MR technologist, right? Just like a mechanic doesn't you know, look for the engine in the front of a Porsche and say, oh, I can't fix this thing. Right. Right? right. You might go and open up the front and say, oh, they put it in the back. But when you get back there, it's still a carburetor. It's still a motor. Okay? And that's how I've always viewed MR. For sure. So we'll get to that stuff later. What a great analogy. Right? Yeah. It is great. Thanks for noticing. I know. You're great. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. You too. And you look great today, by the way. Trying to throw speed bumps in. Is it working? <laughs> uh Look, when somebody when I gives, grew up, it was self speed humps. Speed humps. So people uh, kept stealing the signs. Yep. Oh, yeah, you would. Yeah, yeah, you'd love to have a sign that said hump in your bedroom with your neon light. I could just picture it. Lava lamp, neon light, hump. It's the hump room. Oh, it's, if it's a red light, then your eyes don't have to dilate in the middle of the night. It's Perhaps. actually smart, especially if you have a hypersensitivity. When somebody gives you a compliment, uh, one of the hardest things to do in the whole wide world is to breathe and smile and say thank you. You're right. Thanks, Robert. You're great. Uh, customer two. Other customer. By no means a priority above or below the radiologist. The way I look at it is you got to do right by the rad. You got to do right by the patient. Right. Right. And if you do, you're an MR expert. So now let's talk about how to get that pretty picture in the shortest time. Right. Okay. Now- let me say this. Shortest time benefits everybody involved with the venture. The person paying the rent on the building and paying the note on the machine wants you to do it quickly. Mm -hmm. We want to do it quickly because we have other people to do. The patient wants to do it quickly because they don't want to be in there. Right. There has been this feeling in our business for as long as I can remember that if you're going fast, you're half-assing something. Somebody very smart in my life told me time is not an indicator of image quality. So stop looking at the time and saying, oh, it's not going to look good enough. It's got nothing to do with it. I'm doing 22, 23 second pulse sequences now on the brand new equipment. Well, you got that ARDL, you got deep resolve, and so. The air, the air coils. The technology um, right now. Right? Is wild. Is wild. Right. So how do you do right by the patient? You get them in and out of there. And you get the pretty picture so they can get an accurate diagnosis. But you get them in and out of there. And the less time you have them in the bore, the more time you create to make them comfortable and the more time you create to give them instruction. When I was scanning, the number of five-star reviews I would get that would say, Rob told me exactly what to expect surprised me. 
I wanted to get the five-star review because of all the stuff I knew parameter-wise. Right. They're giving me a five-star review because I told them the next picture was two minutes. They gave me a five-star review because I told them it'd be eight minutes, we'll do an injection, it'll be three minutes more. And I was thinking to myself, doesn't everybody do that? Very few people do that, especially the button pushers. Now, again, let's empathize with the button pusher. Why would a button pusher not be giving clear he instruction? How long? <laughs> Not only do they not know, but they are overwhelmed right. with everything else. It's yeah. like the person on the register for the first day. You know it's their first day because they haven't even said hello to you. Oh, how do you open this right. thing? I can't find a guacamole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need to be competent ones. before your personality comes out. Right. Right? So why do we need to go so fast beyond the fact that they just don't want to be in the noisy bore? And you decrease the, lift, the, 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 the the risk of thermal injury the less time you have them in there. I know thermal injuries can happen acutely, but the less time they're in there, the less likely it is to happen. Right. Uh, you can give them clear instruction on what's going to happen, and you can do a wrist down by the side. You don't have to force them into the Superman position if you're in a wide bore and you know that they can't do that. Uh, you can go put an extra pillow underneath their knees. You can... Use an alternate coil. You brought up these air coils, these blanket-type coils. Ooh. The number of kyphotic patients that come in nowadays that you can now scan with a blanket coil wrapped around their head, and you can't tell that they were done in, that they weren't done in the head coil. It's remarkable. But you only have time to do these things if you're decreasing your pulse sequence times, right? Right. Because you still have an appointment time slot. You got to stay within that window of opportunities. That's right. Every patient has a threat. So if it's a 45-minute appointment time, but the scan itself is only 25 minutes, well, then that means you have 20 minutes to yep. you know, spend extra time with the patient explaining the exam and getting them comfortable. Right. And if you're in a high throughput environment where the exam times are now 15 minutes and you have inefficiencies everywhere around you and your 215 patient, oh, and by the way, you have a 2 and you have a 230, and the 215 patient is arriving at 218, filling out paperwork till 226, getting dressed and using the restroom until 2.33. Still need an IV. Um, and that is real life for a lot of people. Uh, being able to do a wrist exam or an elbow in under four and a half minutes on this new technology is not just helpful. It's a requirement or you will get run over. Yeah. And uh, so there are people that are simply surviving with short imaging times too. And that's a whole different thing. And we've talked a little bit about that. Yeah. But... Getting the patient in and out of there as quickly as you can is how you do right by that patient. So how do you middle it? You got to middle it. You have to. Right? Got to middle it with the rads and the patients. So sometimes it can conflict, right? The resolution, adds time, you know, things like that, right? So how do you middle? It? Well, there's a disconnect for sure. Like the patients don't realize what what's required of their exam for the rads to be happy, and the rads don't understand what's required of the exam for the patients to be happy. I think one thing that Robert does a really good job, and probably why he gets a lot of kudos where we work at, is he's a great communicator with the patients on what they should expect for the exam. It's huge. Um, I think once, cause they, once they understand what, what their role is to actually make it successful, I, I think that it, instead of them having this expectation of it, just a lot of times they come in, they think it's a CT, they're going to be in and out in 10 minutes. And when Robert breaks it down, like, hey, this is, this is what I need from you. This is how long it's going to take. If this is going to be a good study, you know, we have to be consistent in this, blah, 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 whatever Robert's spill is. I think that really helps out with just the outcome of the study, his expectations, giving them realistic expectations. It's so huge. And the- well, and I think with that, w- thank you, Reggie, because I, I get that uh, kudos a lot, too. You said you get a lot of patients who appreciate you just communicating what the expectations are. And I think with that, because, you know, I think the, uh, there's, it's the elf in the room, anxiety, right? You get, every patient has a, a certain, a zero to 10 level of anxiety. Usually it's one to 10. I would say nobody's a zero, but, um, you know, if you could just communicate what the expectations are, then you'll see that anxiety go way down because at the end of the day, they just don't know what to expect. So if you really lay it out and they can picture it, um, you'll see that subside a little bit. And I, I, I see that all the time and I think it's super important because I think, uh, you know, if it's the example that I use with anxiety and like what to expect. We, I mean, we work at one of the outpatient sites. It's in the lower level. It's two floors below the le- ba- the um, floor level. Patients literally get into an elevator <laughs> to come down to MRI to say that they're too claustrophobic for their MRI. 
And so how do you even get in that elevator? Well, it's because you knew you've been on an elevator before. You know what to expect, but you haven't been in an MRI before. So I think that's, that's, a, that's such a powerful uh, example yeah. and story to tell, right? Mm -hmm. That's zooming out. For sure. That's zooming out on claustrophobia. Yeah. To be able to bring the patient back to the elevator. And I, you know, you'll hear from techs that they don't have time. They don't have time to explain the procedure. And I say, well, make the time. Because that's it how become, it, we all have our script. It, it can be become a part of your script, and you can position a patient as you're explaining the. Exam. Oh, I hope you are. Absolutely, it doesn't. It's not mutually exclusive, right? Um, you know, so like to say that you don't have enough time. Well, first of all, you're spending the time positioning. Why you're spending that time? Use it productively. Yep. And this, you know, this is a, again being empathetic to the people who are scared for their lives, who are pushing buttons and hoping things turn out well. I mean, let's all sit in that energy for a minute, okay? We've all been there. We've all been in the spot where you're hitting go on something, right. and when there's 11 seconds left in the pulse sequence, your eyes are glued to the little image reconstructor window, hoping that it, that it looks good. Sure. You know, I was so cocky as I, you know, just for fun, because I try to make students laugh, right? Uh, I would build a protocol organically, every parameter from the scout up, right? And I knew it would be good because I knew what I was doing. And uh, there'd be 12 seconds left, and I, I would say, uh, I'm going to go walk over to the door right now so I can save some time. And they would say, no, but you need to QC your images. I said, I don't QC images. You know, is this kind of my images joke? QC me. You, know, <laughs> <laughs> you guys need to QC images. I already know what it's going to look like because I built the thing, right? right? But if we, but we all remember when we didn't feel that way, right? And it's a terrifying thing, and you're, you feel beholden. You feel like you're, you're hoping it comes out well because you need it to, but it, you have no uh, impact on it, and that's a, a really bad feeling. I figured you guys would ask me for an example, a real life example. Um, so if you want to bring up the tib fib images, Reggie, because I tried to come up with an image or an exam here. Yeah, that, the you guys keep going. That image right there. Uh, Robert, I can wait for you to come back. No, 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 keep going. Yes, we're there. Listen, oh, you got one more drink. No, this is what podcasts are. Keep going. Okay, we'll keep going. Robert says this is what podcasts are. Real life, right, Robert? You don't just show them the best parts. You show them everything. <laughs> Nope. No cap. No cap. <laughs> Cause we're cool. So I don't know that you can truly appreciate it on the screen, but on the left is a stir and on the right is a stir. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I did do my little trick where I built the coronal first and then I just turned it into a sagittal. And that's why the coverage is the exact same. Meaning I showed you just as high north as I did south, yeah. right? So what you see on the left is a stir. By the way, this was a 3T magnet. And on the left is a stir with a TI of 170. And on the right is a stir with a TI of 195. Now, the protocol called for PD fat sats and T2 fat sats. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to try to use a fat saturation technique with a field of view this large because I know that once I get over a 28, 30, 32 centimeter field of view, right. you're going to have a lack of uniform fat saturation, chemical fat saturation. So I immediately pivot and use a stir sequence. But to satisfy what the radiologist wants to see, which is a grayer fat on the PD fat sat and a darker, more high contrast fat saturation on the T2, I changed the TI. No big deal, right? right? The 170 TI gives you that PD fat sat look on the left. The 195 TI gives you that more T2 fat sat on the right. If you were on a 15 magnet instead of 170 and 195, you might use 130 and 155 to show that difference. The higher you go up in field strength, the, the longer it takes. For sure. Um, trying to find that no point. Trying to, yeah, the longer it takes you to get to the no point at higher field strengths because uh, things don't relax as quick. Right. So this is an example, Reg of don't just bring over a fat satur a chemical fat saturation technique on a field of view that's this big because it will be white at the edges. Right. And if that's the area of pathology, uh, you're going to have a problem. And okay. you're not pleasing one of those customers, right? That's right. This is the pretty picture. Yeah, and I love that you just said that. Right. This is satisfying the radiologist. Right. They need uniform fat saturation, fat elimination, as I like to call it. 
Now, I could have also used a Dixon technique on this scanner, but the Dixon technique takes a little bit longer than the stir. For sure. Okay. Now, if this was a with and without contrast study and I had to get fat, eliminate the fat post gadolinium, mm -hmm. I absolutely would have used a Dixon technique because now stir is not an option. Oh, right. Right? right. But it wasn't. So this was a without study. Now, if you go to the next picture, uh, the next one after that, Rich. So these are videos, and I wanted to just kind of show you. So obviously you're looking at the femoral condyles on the picture on the left. So that was the superior stack, and the inferior stack is on the right. Um, I said, look at what TPS said recently. Nope. Just a <laughs> Yeah, lots you're of T. That didn't work, you. Uh, <laughs> Lots of TPS resets when you have neglected chillers on the roof <laughs> that cause high head pressure and um, cause everything to screw up. Total nerd right there. Um, total nerd. <laughs> uh, actually, now that I think about it, go back to the previous picture, if you would, please, Reggie. Yeah. Now, you might ask the question. If I can, let me see. Why separate? This one. Now, why separate the axials and the two stacks? Homogenous. Homogenous. Uniform. Whose job is the elimination of fat? It's one of those three things that make up a pretty picture. You yeah. can tell Robert didn't. Robert was not a student in my program. <laughs> what? I just passed it. Sure. it whose analogous. job? Whose job mine. is it? Mine. Mine is the answer. I'm proud of myself for coming up with <laughs> your own pictures instead of quality image. Well, the funny thing about uh, separating the stacks is I've I've seen where people won't separate it on the axial T ones that don't have fast fat, but then separate it on the uh the actual t2 but you want it to match you want it to match right so you want like, to match right you want it to match and i understand you know why you'd keep it in one main stack on a t1 right. but if you really 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 understand imaging um that many slices you're going to be doing a couple of concatenations anyway right. or acquisitions so you'll make two stacks will be the exact same time as one stack that's, man, that's if I'm you're really paying attention that's really the same time. so absolutely mr jansen fresh off your bathroom break with a clear mind. Yeah. Uniform fat elimination. Right. So now you can go to the next slide, and I put a couple of videos here just so you could click on them and thumb through the images. The image on the left is the superior stack. Do you want to start with this? One? Yep. Oh, it looks like it's starting. Yeah, on. start with either one of them. The only thing I want to show you guys is that you have uniform fat elimination throughout the entire lower leg, and that's what the radiologist needs. Now, to get to that if either one of you are looking at the fat and saying, oh my gosh, is that uniform? Well, I did a couple other things. I put the leg in the damn center of the machine because ISO center is critical when you're trying to chemically saturate fat. That leg is in the middle of the table. Right. It's crazy how many techs that I see that do a hip with the head coil still on the table. It's like, well, if you got the head coil on the table, how are you going to scoot them over to ISO center? We have a rap song. A rap song? Called ISO Center, baby, scoot, scoot. Yeah, I saw that. I actually saw that one, and it's incredible. Actually, Rob, it's very good. <laughs> All right, very good. It's ISO Center. It's two stacks. It's also spectral IR. This is a hybrid technique. Um, on the GE MRI scanner, you have three different fat saturation options under the chemical fat saturation. Yeah. It's fat, it's mm -hmm. classic, and then it's special. Mm -hmm. um, I think Siemens uh, calls it, starts with that letter A, adiabatic or something. You see it on Siemens scanners. Yeah. Under Dura Adirac chair, what is it? I don't no, know it's that. like A-D-I-B-A-T-I-C. Uh, uh, right. Somebody watching this, Matt right. Hayes or Redderer or Toby, those guys would know. Right. Um, I have a stacks question. But hold on. What it is is special is a chemical fat saturation technique with an IR pulse that helps you. That's why that is so dark and uniform. So whenever I'm doing a region of interest that is a ton of slices, because even though I separated this in the two, it's still covering a large area, I prefer the special fat saturation um, because it gives me more uniform. So what am I doing here, right? On the pretty pictures, I'm making sure the leg is in ISO center. I'm making sure I did two different stacks. I'm right. using a fat elimination technique that is best for this exam. And I used IRs instead of chemsats on the long plane sequences because those field of views are too big to have uniform 
fat elimination. And not to, I'm, this is another story from Robert, but uh, how important is your coil, right? Because the coil still plays a big role, at, whether you think so or not. Your coil placement for how well you're going to have fat saturation plays a huge role, right? We talked about an episode, the second episode I did when we talked about the part. Yes. Part, um, um, P2, um, yeah. the body part from the coil, the distance. And I showed you a slide that showed one centimeter away from the coil results in 40% less signal. Right. Or an X. Or a, yep. It's like losing an X. X. Losing an X when you move the coil from here to there. Right. Inch, whatever. Wild. Yes. Uh, actually, the analogy that I, and I like that, yeah, for sure, because that kind of gets more mathematical. But uh, visually speaking, somebody once said it was Jonathan. He said, that, think of the coil as like a stethoscope. The further away from the anatomy that you're looking at, the less you're going to hear, see. Yep, it's perfect. Jonathan is good at zooming out. Oh, yeah. He, uh, he's good at zooming out. Right. Let's go around the room and say one thing we love about Jonathan. That was mine, right? His beard. His beard. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's genuine. I just like him because he's a genuine guy, super nice, stand-up guy. Oh, you know what's great about that? We didn't realize we did it, but I complimented his professional expertise. You complimented him to his core, right. and you talked about his vanity. This yeah. is great. So we, we covered all we covered three. It. Yeah, if he ain't satisfied with that, then he can... Yeah, jo- can, yo, you better like it. Subscribe. Yeah. So is that like the caps of Jonathan? What would those CAPs be for? <laughs> it's so stupid. Yeah, I don't know. Can we can we think of something real quick? Yeah, we could, but in what context? Who he is as a person. So P would be. Oh, the P is the personality. Person? No, this is go- this is going down a rabbit yeah. hole that's uninteresting to people who don't know John. Yeah. I've, I've attracted this. Exit out of the YouTube. A is attracted this. this. Yeah, yeah, point. yeah. I don't blame you. C is. No, C is competent. I got it. I got it, you guys. This is what happens when you let fame go to your head, right? right? And you don't remember that the shit that you think is interesting ain't interesting to everybody. It's like Corey Feldman, right? (laughs) Hey, listen. It's like he's putting all this in. That's that's, that's a cheap shot. But, you know, he's very serious about what he's doing. But when other people see it, they're like, what is that? Right. You know, you got to be aware of what your audience is. I'm playing to the back of the room. I'm a comedian. That's what they do. So C is competency, A is attractiveness, and P is personality. You're welcome. Moving on. Very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you didn't assess for motion, rap, and time under personality. Get the timestamp on this because I want to send it to John. <laughs> Here's what I'll leave you guys with. Okay. Uh, and this is no filter. If you're a button pusher, you're a button pusher. It's okay. It has to do with your training. It has to do with how the market forces needed you in here so rapidly. It's philosophy from radiologists and administrators before you who thought that don't touch the protocols, just run them. It was a short-sighted product of the system. But you're here. Right. Your task is to recognize that that's what you are. And to be honest about how uncomfortable you are at work day to day and be open to changing. And if you can do that, there are systems, not just the ones that I presented here today, but other systems that you've had other guests come on and this is how you can learn. This is how you can grow and get busy growing. Um, You don't need to be scared at your job. Because you work 40, 50, 60 hours a week, you want to be calm and relaxed at your job because if your nervous system is stressed out 40, 50, 60 hours a week, you're going to start to look old. (laughs) Life gets harder. You have all this hate and you don't want it. You want to feel free, competent, and part of something bigger than yourselves when you're at work. And these are the answers. You have to understand the whys. The memorizing the what's in the hows will only get you so far. I want you to create your own what's in house because then you can take, you know, an interest in what you're doing. You can consider yourself an artist and you can say, hey, Reggie, let me show you how I did this. Right. Subclavian MRA. Have you ever done one before? No. Who cares? Who cares? You got to inject contrast at a specific time and you have to do a T1 weighted spoiled gradient echo with a large field of view in the coronal plane, thin cuts, 
It's the same way you do a renal. It's the same way you do a runoff. It's the same way you do every contrast enhanced artery. Do you have any, like for some of the green people out there, like do you have any recommended resources that they can like, because a lot of, especially if they're watching this episode right now, we already know that you are going home and you're, you're kind of doing your due diligence because you want to improve, right? You want to understand the field. But what are some of the resources you would recommend to kind of, you know, kind of help them navigate some of those questions they might have? There are a lot of them. So just because I don't say a particular one doesn't mean I don't believe in it. Probably means I haven't spent a lot of time with it. I think the most robust website that's ever been put together is mriquestions.com. Um, that's great. Uh, that radiologist, um, um, yeah. he's over there in Chattanooga or somewhere yeah. or yeah. Easter, Al Easter, something like that. mriquestions.com is the most comprehensive quality um, explanation of MRI concepts topics and if and if you want to go into the real weeds he has something that says advanced discussion here you can click and you can go even deeper right the amount of time that that person put into that site is sure so that's if you're looking for information that's where i would go uh other than that you need to remember that mri is non-ionizing radiation and you can put your friends in there and practice on them right so when you have when your schedule allows Talk to your administrators, put people in there. You still have to read them. There's a process to it, right? You can't just take images and not show them to a rad, but there's a there's a way to be able to use the MRI scanner to hone your skills and scan your friends and scan your coworkers and change the echo trains and change the bandwidths and change the acceleration factors, use different antennas, change your phase directions, start learning sure. what happens when you make this change or when you make that change. Those are those those are the I think you're oh, 100% right in. One other thing, Reg, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, no, you're good. One other thing, read the reports. That's a good one. Two days later, log on, take a guess. Was it a meniscal tear? Was it an MCL sprain? Is it bursitis in the shoulder? What kind of lesion was that? Was that MS? Or was it just periventricular white matter disease? Learn what you're looking at. Yeah, because they will literally mention the sequence that that pathology is highlighted on the most, right? So That's you right. you got to understand how important that sequence is. I think that's, that's brilliant. That's right. You get a claustrophobic person in there for a shoulder, yeah. start with the coronal intermediate fat suppressed image because they're going to do all their diagnosing from that for the most part. Read the reports. That's right? Great. But the last thing you want to do is do a sagittal T1 or a coronal T1 and then have the patient wave the white flag and they have nothing. <laughs> right. 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 Call back. Call back. Right. What were you going to say? I, I jumped um, in front of you because I wanted to. Oh, no, up. I was just going to say, like, even if, if even if your facility won't let you scan and things like that, there are these so many resources out there that are popping up with these virtual scanning uh, technologies, right, where you can actually scan, like, practice with, you know, out having access to a scanner and stuff like that. I know Matt Hayes, one of, Matt, we love that dude with um, Scan Lab. Scan Lab. Yes. Yeah, so. I haven't used it, but I hear great oh, things. Powerful. That thing, it gets better and better every year. Um, and then, of course, there's CoresMed that has something, too, as well. So um, I don't know how the individual licenses work for either one of those companies, but uh, you're right. Really, I'm, I'm a very tactile person. I need to get my hands on it and see, like, if I do this, then this will happen type of thing. So having access to those type of tools, I can see being super beneficial or just being able to do that when you have downtime. You're just, you're just, you're going to accelerate the amount of learning that you have. So nice. Well, thanks, Rob. You got anything else, Rob? You're welcome. Oh, you're thinking him. Please, <laughs> the real reason why we're here. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just this might be off topic, but you mentioned like making sure you do run certain sequences first. I, I try to tell patients or uh, text this, and and correct me if I'm wrong, but I always do my repeats last. And the reason why? Yeah, without question. Is I saw a patient or a tech the other day doing a prostate. And they really wanted to make sure they got a good axial T2, TSE, right? And so they did it, a little bit of motion. So then they ran another one, did. So then they ran a third one, Oh, did it. And then the patient tapped out. Like what are they changing when they're running it? Are they just doing a communication, communication? Yeah, it's really important that you don't move, put a sandbag on their legs, whatever, these sort of things, you know? Right. So um, I would say do your repeats last. Like, so if, had they gotten a, dif a, a diffusion, that would have been super beneficial. But that kind of, that goes back to the critical thinking skills, why and not what. Right. Understanding the bigger picture is zooming out. And so 
And most of us had to learn this from experience. So the people who are watching who doesn't, who didn't know this and are getting it like firsthand right now, it's extremely valuable. Like to, you know. Yeah, if you get C quality images on a T2 axial and a diffusion, it's better than constantly trying to get that A on that T2 axial and never getting the diffusion. Um, so things to think about, like you said, zooming out, seeing the bigger picture, I'm always surprised by what the rats can see too on some of those motion images. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. I mean, how many times have I reached out to a rat and say, hey, look, is this worth proceeding? Right. I mean, it, and it could be artifact from a susceptibility artifact like a pacemaker, or it might be so much motion. Is this worth repeat or uh, proceeding? And they'll say, yeah, keep going. And then you're like, but really was it though? And you go back, like you said, and you read the report and it turns out it was diagnostic. So... I uh, would like to answer your question in a multi-faceted way, and I would say, yes, your repeats should be last, right? Because you wind up with three axial T2s and nothing else, and that's not productive. Um, and then there's a part two to that, which is through your experience, you recognize the order of importance for those sequences, and you nailed it, right? The axial T2 and the axial diffusion on the prostate is 99% of the prostate, right? So that comes later, and you can reprioritize those ones earlier if you think a patient can't get through it. You know, I showed you one example on this lower leg. I'll leave you with this, really leave you with this. Breast patient came in. They had a loop recorder. Well, if you listen to the mid-level managers out there who are not MR experts, many of them, and they say, do the protocol, don't change the field of view, run it just as it is, right? Your button push buttons and stop making a big deal about it, right? Well, if you do a breast, most breast protocols still use chemical fat saturation, right? right. Because Dixon Techniques mess with the CAD. Yeah. Although we need to get in front of that sooner rather than later and talk to the CAD providers because Dixon is the most robust fat elimination technique. Um, and on this breast exam, I absolutely used a Dixon Technique because they had a loop recorder and that loop recorder with the susceptibility artifact would have caused a lack of uniform fat elimination right on the breast, which is where they're looking. And the radiologist called and said, why'd you use a Dixon technique? And I told them why. And they said, yeah, but this messes, messes with the cat. And I said, well, figure it out. Call the cat provider, do something. See, there's, a, there's something that happens to technologists when, when they're not allowed to flourish and understand the why. Right. Well, and on the other hand of that, the rad would have been upset and asked, like, okay, why didn't you use another sequence? Like, why is the fat saturation so poor on this? Too, yes. Right? Well, oftentimes rads want to see the bad before they say, oh, I see what you did. Right. Well, I don't play that game. Right. I already know what it's going to do. Right. I don't need you to right. sign off on, I don't need to show you a bad image to be allowed to run the one I should have run to begin with. Right. That whole, that whole thing, run a stir if the T2 fat sat doesn't look good. In button pusher world, they'll say, oh, no, but you have to run the T2 fat sat and show them the bad fat sat, then run the stir. A T2 fat sat is a stir. It's a different technique. It's the exact same thing. And that's why the ACR says dark fat, bright fluid, right? They understand. Right. So, again, I sound so boxy right now, but I'm really trying to unlock the technologist to understand the whys and the critical thing, be the artist, have fulfillment at their job, not live in fear, and actually love what they do. Because when you really get into MR, you realize it's never ending. Right. And you show up to work every day excited to learn. That's been my experience. Yep. Same. So, yep. Same here. Well, that's why we're here sitting here on a Sunday. Right. On a day off. Yeah, for sure. Exactly, man. Well, as always, Rob, you're awesome. Dude, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, fellas. You're the best. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Anything you're working on, anything you want to give a shout out to? No, no, no. 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 Shout out to you two. Um, okay. Keep on going, like I always tell you. And uh, you guys are making MR cool. Hey, appreciate that. Thank you, Matt. And check out Care Report. That's right. Toby, shout out. Um, well, Zone 3 Podcast, Reggie, are we missing anything? And no, uh, you know, thank you guys for your patience. I know we haven't really released anything in a while, but you know, it comes in spurts for us. So we just want to make sure that the content is good that we're providing. So, you know, you're never going to catch any, you're not going to catch us slipping, long story short. So. Yeah, and it's based on the our guests of availability. And, right. Um, and, yeah, like we, uh, like you said, we, um, we still got a lot of good things coming. So you guys just keep being patient. We appreciate all our subscribers, all our supporters. 
you know, hey, it's on three podcasts. We are out. Good. <laughs>